there, and welcome to New Life Church. We're glad you can join us. Before the message begins, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to all our social media platforms so that you can stay informed on all our latest content and events. If you feel led to invest in the ministry, please visit our website, newlifelancaster.org forward slash give. Thank you again, and God bless. Tonight, we want to turn our attention to the Word of the Lord. I want to go to a rather familiar portion of Scripture. The title of the message tonight is, What is Man? As I thought of it, and that comes directly from the text, I thought of one of the things that we hear all the time in the news nowadays, a question that seems to haunt our nation. What is a woman? It's a peculiar question, in my opinion. Pretty stupid question because the answer is rather clear. I think God made it clear in his word. So if I can not really even borrow from the language of this question floating around, let me just remind you tonight that the question in terms of what is, speaking of man or woman, was one-upped thousands of years ago by King David. It was long before 20th, 20th or 21st century people began to ask what it is. Without the same peculiar thoughts in mind, King David asked, what exactly are we? He wasn't talking about gender. He wasn't talking about characteristics. But in the grand scheme of things, in the eyes of God, David said, what is man? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 8. I first fell in love with Psalm 8 back in it was summer around 1974, 75, when I was in Bible school. I was taking a class on the Psalms, and our professor had us memorize Psalm 8. That was the first time I really began to fall in love with this passage and remained in love with it since then. I want to read it from two translations tonight. I want to first read it from the King James, and then I want to read it from the NIV, and that's where we'll be focusing tonight. I want to read it from the King James because not only of its accuracy in part, but there's a poetry to Psalm 8 in King James that I want to rehearse for us tonight. Psalm 8, beginning at verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, thou, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The same passage from the NIV. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies. To silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all that swim the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What is man? Join me in a word of prayer. Father, as we open your word tonight, please help us, O oh God, I pray, to rightly divide the word of truth. Our concern tonight, our interest tonight, is more than the poetry or the rhythm of this passage but what are the truths that you have placed therein for mankind for all of time, ever since these words were penned? 
So God, we pray tonight in the name of Jesus that you will help us. Lord, once again, as we often pray, help us, God, not simply to sermonize. Help us to communicate. Help us, oh God, not to invest a lot of opinion in what we share tonight, but God, help us to the best of our ability to open the word of God, to understand what you are saying to us, what you are saying to and through your servant David for the people of that day and for all of humanity for the rest of time. So now, God, we commend this time to you. Be glorified in all that is said and done, we pray. And God, we seal these things together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. When we look at Psalm 8, as we mentioned before, this psalm in its 12 verses is a number of things. It is poetic. It is majestic. In many ways, it is prophetic. And it is certainly, generally, just a fascinating passage of Scripture. While it makes reference to that which ultimately will finally find its fulfillment only in Jesus Christ, It speaks primarily of the unparalleled status and the divine intent that God had and has for the sons of men. Let me say it again. It speaks in here ultimately, and we'll look at it as we go into the New Testament in a few moments, of some things that will only reach their fullest restoration through Jesus Christ. But the primary thing he talks about here has to do with the answering of that question What is man? He talks about the unparalleled status and the divine intent that God had way back from creation, answering the question before it was ever even asked, what is man? In order for us to capture that, the psalmist then had to look away from several things. He had to look away from the fall of man and all of its destruction, all of its heritage of woe. He had to, in answering this question, turn away from the brokenness of mankind. He had to look away from our sins and our failures and our rebellions. And he had to draw our attention to man's nature, to man's position, to man's destiny in the original purposes of God. So as we look at Psalm 8, we're going to be looking at God's purposes. We also will look again as we look at both Testaments that the purposes of God that are spoken of in Psalm 8 and prior to Psalm 8 are not currently being activated by mankind because you've allowed sin to interrupt it. We see spurts of it here and there. And I trust that after we study this passage, we'll see it even more because it's currently available to us in Jesus Christ. But I want us to take a look at what King David is talking about. A little background information in terms of the authorship It is widely accepted that David was the author of Psalm 8. I found no debate over that issue at all. Although the internal evidence in the passage doesn't give his name, scholars believe that he certainly was the one who wrote that. Nothing in the text clearly states that, though. Concerning the circumstances of his writing, several scholars suggest that it might have happened at various times. Again, the text doesn't indicate to us what was it that drove David to pick up the pen and write these words. Could have been many things. Let me give you three possibilities that are considered. David could have penned these words when he brought up the ark to the house of Obed-Eben, Obed, Obed-Edom. He could have wrote it, written it at that time because there was such great joy that the ark is returning. And some believe that he might have, thinking of the majesty of God, written this portion of the word at that time. Some believe it might have been in the expression of joy when he possessed Mount Zion and took that for the Lord. That in in a sense of elation, he again picks up the pen, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And some still believe that it might have been when he conquered Goliath, conquered this adversary of Israel, this one who blasphemed the name of God, that on the heels of that he picked up the pen and talked about the God of creation. Could have been any, could have been all of those things. The occasion of David's writing is a mystery, but the content of his writing is not. Judging from the psalm itself, it seems probable that David wrote this psalm at night simply because of what he says. 
David talks in this psalm about contemplating the heavens. Listen to what he says in verse 3. He said, when I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man? You are mindful of him. The absence of mentioning the sun, the absence of mentioning daytime clouds suggests to us that in all likelihood when David wrote this, it was sometime in the evening or sometime at night when he's contemplating this part of God's creation and he's captivated by that very thing. Considering what he was seeing, it's not unnatural for David then to recognize the comparative, if I can use this term, the comparative littleness of himself. And the comparative littleness of mankind in general. When I consider the works of your hands, the moon and the stars. I don't know if you've ever done anything like that, but I do. One of the things I enjoy is heat lightning. Now, I don't know if we have it out here. I don't recall seeing it since I've been out here. We saw it in New Jersey often, especially from driving down the highway. And there were these flashes of light. It seemed they would go this way. These flashes of lightning, no sound, no thunder. But it's like, whoosh, there it goes. I think that's fascinating. I think the sky is fast. I love storms from a safe place. I love storms. I love the ocean to sit at the beach and just listen to the waves crashing in. I can do it for hours. Do it for hours. Listening to the sound of the seagulls when they're not making deposits on those of us who are on the ocean. But listening to all those things, fascinated. And that's what David was thinking. Lord, when I consider the works of your hands, the moon and the star, what am I? What am I? He sees the vastness of part of God's creation, and he asks the rhetorical question, what is man that you're mindful of him? The psalm does not appear originally to contain any designed reference to the Messiah. I'm going to show you in here where the Messiah talks in here. We see reference to the Messiah later. But in its original design, we have no evidence in this psalm that David at the moment was speaking of the Messiah. However, we get to the book of Hebrews, and it shows by its language that what David speaks of here in the Psalms will only be completed in and through the person of Jesus Christ. Unless you think we make it up, let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, and I want to begin reading at verse 5. We'll read verses 5 through 8. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels, you crowned him with glory and with honor, and you put everything under his feet. Putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. We find the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of all dominion completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But there's something of this that God says belongs to the children of men. And it was designed by God to be given to us at creation. So that brings us then to this psalm. Now I was going to, if, if you've been with me for a while, you know that often when I preach or teach, I love to use alliteration. I just think that way. It just kind of happens. But not tonight. We're going to walk verse by verse through this brief psalm and give the bulk of our attention to the first five verses. So let's start with verse one. He starts off with a phrase that in our English understanding, we can miss a great deal of what he's saying. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. O Lord, O Yahweh, O Adonai, how excellent is your name in all the earth. He uses two different names for God in this one quick sentence. O Lord, Yahweh, it is the preferred name of God. 
It is the name of God by which he introduced himself to mankind. If we go back, and I won't take the time to read it tonight, but if you're taking notes, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Noah, or Moses, is standing before the burning bush. God is giving him an assignment to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh that he must let God's people go. Moses is deliberating back and forth with God, and then he says, well, who should I say sent me? If they ask me, what, what is the name of our God? What God sent me? God simply said, I am that I am. Loosely translated, Yahweh. We don't know how to properly pronounce that name of God. The Jews held it in such high esteem that they would not even pronounce it. But our loose translation of that is Yahweh. So David starts off by saying, oh God. He calls God by his preferred name, by the name by which God introduced himself. Oh Yahweh, Adonai, Lord. Oh Lord, our Lord. Adonai generally carries a couple nuances. Not only the nuance of ownership, as in a master owning slaves, if you would. And the term was used for that when it was speaking of human beings. But when it's used of the Lord, it doesn't carry just the nuance of ownership. Adonai carries the nuance of authority. So he says, O oh Lord, O oh Yahweh, the one who is in charge, the God who is in charge, how excellent is your name. It speaks of God as the ruler or governor of the universe. So he starts off this, before he gets to all the other stuff, he starts off this psalm talking about the majesty of God. The psalmist immediately acknowledges Yahweh as being the rightful ruler, the king, the master, and the sovereign of all that is. So in choosing two names, it wasn't like, ah, I think I'm going to be a little bit different when I write here. There was a message in the words of King David, O oh Lord, the sovereign one, how excellent is your name. I was thinking earlier, and I won't do it. This is not a warning that we're going to be here all night. But I was thinking, man, you could do an entire weekend retreat on these 12 verses. We think of the excellence. We think of the sovereignty of Almighty God. One of the things that I love is that David still had that fresh sense of reverence for God. One of the things that I don't know about you, but for me, it breaks my heart is, and we've seen it now for several decades, just a lack of reverence for many things, but not the least of which is for God. There was a time we used to walk much more softly in the presence of God, how we use his name, how we treat his children, how we come into his house. We slap God on the back now, yo, big dog, what's happening? Now, we don't say that to him, but that's pretty much how... Often, modern-day Christianity treats him. That was not the heart of David. And that was not the heart of God when it was reflective of how he chose to be treated by his own people. David captures something of the majesty of God and the reverence that belongs to God because of that. O oh, Yahweh, our Adonai, sovereign one, how excellent is your name. Is that word excellent here means majestic or glorious or great. It's funny, I can't read this passage in the NIV without thinking of Sandy Patty. And many of you know, oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic. I won't sing any more of it. You have set your glory. Look at what he says. How excellent is your name. You have set your glory above the heavens. The word glory here similarly means majesty or your authority. God, you've set your, your authority. You've set your glory. You've set your majesty above the heavens. This idea of setting is important. He said, you have set your glory. You have exalted it to the highest place. You have exalted your own glory, your own majesty to the highest possible place, to the highest possible degree. Once again, we find David standing in awe of God and recognizing exactly who God is. Verse 1. Verse 2. From the lips of children... And infants, King James, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, you have ordained praise. Some of your Bibles say strength because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. What is he talking about here? 
this same thing was quoted by Jesus. Matthew 21, beginning at verse 12. And I want to read to verse 16. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? Jesus hearkens back then to Psalm 8. And he is talking then about literal children. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, out of the mouths of children and infants, you have ordained, some translations say you have perfected praise. So we want to take a look at what's happening here because some people believe he wasn't talking in Psalms. Jesus was clearly talking about children, and that's not a bad interpretation. But some believe that when David was talking in Psalm 8, he was not talking about literal children at all. But that he was comparing the finiteness of man to the humble and weak state of children, making the overtaking of their enemies that much more pronounced. So let me see if I can make this clear. The imagery is simply this. The imagery is man's natural inability to fulfill the works of Almighty God. You and I can't just conjure up the strength to do the work of Almighty God. And some scholars believe, he said, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have perfected praise. He said, men are like children. When it comes to doing my work, they're like children. They need me to get the job done. And I use them to still the enemy and the avenger. In and of itself, that verse almost doesn't seem to make sense until we get a glimpse of what he was talking about. Now, yes, it is accurate and it is true. What Jesus said when he used this passage to talk about children, and we often turn to this passage of baby dedications and so on. But in its context, back in the Old Testament, Jesus was talking about man. This does not mean that children in their great innocence are not worshiping God in purity. But he's talking about something that happens here that will confound the enemies of God and of his people. So we want to see what it is he was saying. Out of the mouths of children and infants, you have ordained praise. The word ordained means to establish or to make a foundation. Out of the mouths of whatever this means, by infants and children, you have established praise. Now the next word is curious too. Because it's translated praise. And it's also translated strength. So of which does the scripture really speak? In the lexicon, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it renders this word praise. And that is likely where Jesus, in that meaning of the word, took his directive when he shared it with those in the temple courts. The Hebrew primarily means strength or might. Praise or strength. Or might. What is the point? Here is the point. From such an unexpected source, out of the mouths of infants and children, from such an un and we're going to go with the Hebrew when it talks about strength or might. From such an unexpected source, God manifests His might, and thereby confounds His enemies. Now. Is there any other place in Scripture where it gives us an idea of God doing something like this? Where God takes that which is unreasonable and he confounds, in this case, the enemies of God. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We begin at verse 26. And I want to read to verse 29.
Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world to despise, and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. God is known to have chosen the foolish things in the eyes and the estimation of man to confound the wise, the things that don't make sense logically. But he's chosen us to confound the wise. You know something that doesn't make sense logically? Tithing does not make sense logically. It just doesn't. Do the math. It just doesn't make sense. When you give to God 10 from the top, you can do more with 90% than you could with 100, 100 yourself if you use it on yourself. Doesn't make sense mathematically, but God is the only place in Scripture where he said, test me and see if I don't open windows and blessings you can barely contain. God doesn't have to make sense in our estimation. God is God. So he says those who comparatively may be like children to you, maybe to the enemies. He said these are the ones that God would use to confound the wise. Because the hand of almighty God rests upon them. Go back to Psalm 8. Verse 2. From the lips of children and infants... You have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Verse 3. When I consider the heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place or which you have ordained. When I consider, interesting word, very simple. But it means to see with one's eyes. Now, it may have many other meanings to perceive, to experience, to understand, to know, to observe. But if I understand properly, every one of those times it is used, it begins with seeing something to understand it. So he says this. He said, when I see, when I consider, going back again to what he's looking at, when I consider your works, when I consider your heavens and the work, the workmanship of your finger, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, which you have established, which you have set in place. God, I'm looking all around. I want to encourage you. In those times when maybe you never have those times and you're feeling just a little bit low. Nobody around seems to have the answer. None. Step aside and get alone with God and the magnificence of his own creation. And allow God to show you the same things he showed to David. When I consider your heavens, the workmanship of your fingers, of your hands. I've heard many say that because it happens so very often that the birth of a child is not a miracle. I personally take issue with that. The work of your hands that God you have created. The way the body has a way of kind of healing itself or being restored, the work of God's hands, birds, how they fly. I'm often mystified by these little gelatinous orbs that we have stuck in our face and how they can see. Or a little flap of skin tucked way inside here and it vibrates and hits against the hammer and we can understand language and sounds and the beauty around us. When I consider your heavens, the work of your hands, and all the things that you have ordained and set in place, when I consider that, this is the question that comes to mind. What is man that you are mindful of him? Now, I want to spend just a little time on verses 4 and 5. What is man? Let me toss out a couple of rhetorical questions for you. What is there in man that entitles him to be so noticed? No one can deny that man has the attention of Almighty God. But what is there about man that entitles us to be so noticed? What has God conferred or what has God bestowed upon 
mankind that makes us so unique? And how can one whose lifespan, according to the word of God, is like a vapor, it's gone. However many years we have, compared to all of eternity, our life is like a vapor. How can one whose life is so brief be so significant? He said, what is man that you're mindful of him? I love the honesty of David in all of his writings. This word mindful means to remember. God, why do you remember man? What makes you think about man? What makes you recall him? What makes you acknowledge man? I've said to people many times, God, or you're on the heart of God. You're on God's mind. And I mean that. When somebody comes up to you and they just say, I've just really been impressed to pray for you. And they may even share with you what it was about. And it seems like, how did they know? It's not because God is a tattletale. But God loves us enough that when we're in need, he'll nudge another member of his body and say, just pray. You don't need the details. Just pray. And whenever that happens, it's a reminder that we have God's attention. But what are we? Compared to the vastness of all that God has made, who are you? Who am I? That God recalls me, that he acknowledges me, that God knows me by name, that God thinks about me. When you wake up in the morning, if mom and dad aren't thinking about you, God is. When you go to bed at night, God is. When you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off, God is thinking about you. You're his child. When somebody congratulates you and says, well done, God is thinking about you. When somebody lies on you and says something's not right, God is thinking about you because you and I are his child. And David said, compared to all that you have made, what am I? What am I that you would even take the time to acknowledge who I am? It's a marvelous question, folks. And you know why it's marvelous? Because David gives us the answer. If he didn't give us the answer, I don't know if he's not playing with us. But in this same psalm, he asks the question, and he gives the answer. What is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man, my descendants, my children, that you care about them? You pay attention to them. And that takes us to verse 5. Verse 4 is the question. Verse 5 is the answer. The question, what is man that you're mindful of him? Verse 5, he says this. You made him a little lower than the the heavenly beings, angels in some translation. Crowned him with glory and with honor. Give me just a few minutes on this verse. He said, you made him a little lower than the angels. We find the same thing again back in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. The word... But the expression here, a little lower, literally means, I'm going to give you a couple different renditions of it. It means to want or to lack. There's something that is missing. And what he's getting at here, he says, but you're a little inferior. And again, he uses the name God. He said, you made him a little bit lower than Elohim. This is the third name of God that he uses in this brief psalm. O Yahweh, our Adonai, how excellent is your name in all the earth. What is man? You're mindful of him. You made him a little lower than Elohim. Elohim, the name Elohim occurs more than 2,600 times in the Old Testament. And although on occasions it might be used for spiritual beings, angels, that sort of thing, predominantly it is designated to the one true God. So it's not coincidental that he says to us, you have made him a little lower than Elohim. You made him a little lower than God. A little lower is a critical thing for us to understand here for a few reasons. While man was created in the image of God, and I want to say this slowly, while man has been created in the image of God, and while man has been given a spirit In the likeness of God. While man has been given the capacity to commune with and to fellowship with God, man will forever remain infinitely inferior to God. Even at the apex of creation. 
So if he is talking here about God, you made him a little bit lower than God. We have to go back to creation to really get an understanding of what he's talking about. But he serves notice. He's a little lower. He's inferior to God. He who was made out of all the things in creation, the only thing the Bible says was made in the image or likeness of God was us. The only thing given a spirit designed to commune with Almighty God was us with human beings. And when he asked, what is man? Man is the one thing that I have made to look like me. That's what the answer is. You were made in the image of Almighty God. I was made in the image of Almighty God. So when David is laying on his back looking at the stars saying, God, I see all this. What am I? Let me tell you what you are. You're the one thing I made to look like me. Always a little inferior. You'll never be God. And I want to mention that because the scripture mentions it. And because it safeguards us against false teaching. It wasn't that many years ago when people were saying, we're little gods. We are not little gods. There is only one true God. But we have been made in the image of Almighty God. And that's intrinsic. Made in the image of God. Man is confined to the flesh. Man is subject to sin. Man is destined to die. God is not. And those things reflect the inferiority of man. Please understand that. Made in the image of God. But God cannot sin. We can. God is not confined to the flesh. We are. God will never die. Unless he blows the horn before we go that way, we will. A little lower, a little inferior to Elohim, but with my image stamped upon. Did this make sense, guys? This is what David is getting at. Nonetheless, man stands far above everything else in all of God's creation. Psalm 8 is a celebration of God, Almighty God, a celebration of Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim. But God celebrates man. If you ask me, what are you? He says, you're the one that looks like me. As cute as a collie might be, it's not made in the image of God. Or a baboon or a rhinoceros or a monkey or a parrot. Cute, they serve their purpose. But it's us who have been made from the dust of the earth in the image of Almighty God. And the Bible tells us that God has invested within us some, that, some of the things that reflect his own glory. That's the language of the text. Verse 4 holds the question. Verse 5 holds the answer. Man, my friends, is different by design. Literally, thou hast made him less than God. Because we are finite. We are limited. So when you look at yourself and think, man, I... I just can't seem to get this right. I can't. You're finite and limited. We are. When we're critical of ourselves and think, God, am I ever really going to grow? Am I ever really going to be that man or woman of God you want me to be? We're limited. But then whenever those things cross your mind, also remind yourself, but I'm made in the image of my heavenly Father. Glory to God. And that's not boasting. That's reminding us, how do you think David stood? How do you think the nation of Israel, those who are faithful to God, stood? Because they realized we've been made in the image of Almighty God. When you and I are viciously critical of ourselves, remind yourself. Look in the mirror and remind yourself of all the things that God has created, all the majesty that God has created What's in that mirror is the one thing that he said, I made you to look like me. Glory to God. I can run for a little while on that one. I'm almost done. Man was made in the image of God, which is spoken of nothing else in all of creation. In his original creation, man stood head and shoulders above every other work of Almighty God. Head and shoulders. None of us would debate that. If you go back and read the first two or three chapters of Genesis, 
Folks, it is still true to this day. If we were more elevated than the cricket in Genesis 1 and 2, we still are. The majesty of a lion or those great things, the steeds that God had made and all their beauty, they don't hold a candle to you and to me. Folks, don't believe it because Bradley said so. Read the book. What is man that you're mindful of him? For the son of man, God retort, I made you a little bit less than myself. Very much like me. Made to commune with me. Just a little bit less than myself. In respect to his dominion, and this is, we must understand this. In respect to his dominion over the earth, man has been placed in a powerful condition. Infused with the strength and the blessing of Almighty God. Always a bit inferior. Because on our best day, you and I are not God. I was going to say, if those things are true, since those things are true, consider what we forfeited when man sinned in the garden. Creation was fresh. We have no idea how old Adam and Eve were when they sinned. But there was no sin around. And in the midst of the beauty of the garden and all that God had created, the same moon and stars that David saw in Psalm 8 were there in creation. Everything was right. Everything was pure. Everything was holy. Everything was sanctified. But man was duped. And look at what we forfeited. Made in the image of God. And we forfeited. He said, I've given you dominion. We forfeited the active dominion that God had given to us in the garden. Not entirely, but in part. Purchased back by Jesus Christ. May I tell you this, the same tactic the enemy uses today. Has God really said, ah, you're worthless. You'll never accomplish X, Y, Z. The enemy's never going to come and tell you on those bad days, you know, you've been made in the image of God. He's not going to do that. He's not going to do it. He's not going to tell you how to get life right. He's going to do all that he can to cause us to forfeit the glory of what God placed within us. Listen to the last few verses of this psalm. And they need no great explanation. Verses 6 through 8. He simply enumerates the many things over which he had given man dominion. In the garden, look at verse 6. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all that swims in the paths of the sea. He simply enumerates. He said, God, you made us a little bit lower than yourself. You gave us dominion, and he begins to list a very short list of some of those categories, some of those places of dominion. And then he closes with this. He repeats this glorious declaration of verse 1. In case David didn't get it when he wrote it in verse 1, he repeated it again in the last verse. In case we don't get it in verse 1, he reminds us in verse 9. He says, To be redundant. You know how somebody says, well, I don't want to be redundant. And they just told you what they're getting ready to do. To be redundant. David repeats what he said in verse 1. O Lord, O Yahweh, our Adonai, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's Psalm 8. And that's the answer to the question, what is man? What is man? We have tainted that for years and years and years. But in purity, David asked the question, Jeremy, do you have a song for us? Or it just anyone, even if you do one of the ones we did. What is man? What is man? I wanted to share this with you tonight because I want you to be encouraged. Every one of us has challenging moments. Every one of us has difficult days. And every one of us might do what David did when he asked, 
What is man? Whether it's in the broad and general sense of God, who am I? Who am I? Especially if we've gotten a lot of bad press. And unfortunately, there are many people around who will tell you things about yourself that are not altogether lovely. And if that's happened and we believe that we've absorbed those things, we might have stood with David and said, who am I? What am I? And the Lord comes back and he says, this is who you are. I made you like me. I made you like me. And I've given you dominion because I love you with an everlasting love. And David closes his thoughts with a note of worship. God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Amen? Stand with me if you would. We want to pray. And after we pray, Jeremy's going to lead us in a song of worship. And then take some time. I want to encourage you along these lines. I tried not to make this passage real complicated and then we had to dig in the weeds a little bit because I wanted us to understand it because it could seem rather confusing made a little lower than angels what does that mean we need to understand what he was saying what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou considerest him what is he talking about so as we open it up I pray every time we look into the word God changed something on the inside of me and I want to encourage you to do this tonight, if you have time, and I'm not monitoring anybody. But we're going to sing, and then if you have the time where you feel the need, just to kind of sit with God for a few moments and chew on the word. Don't rush. Don't rush. Push dinner back 10 minutes or whatever else is next. But take some time to let God speak and let his word take root 